and welcome to the Great Big Indian Wellness Show. My name's Tony Patty, your host for today, and joining me today are three very, very uh, clever, astute, and specialist people. They are Rajan Shah from Art Couture, they are Angelique Perez, founder of D Style Dance, and Jay Ragani, mindset and sound, pra sound practitioner from Optimum Wellbeing. I'll tell you more about them in just a moment. Today's program's all about the art of mindfulness, and we're going to be talking to our specialists, uh, advisors, and professionals today to see how we can develop various characteristics of mindfulness, everything from intention to cultivating awareness. Uh, to what's occurring in the present moment and simply observing thoughts, feelings, sensations as they arise. And also attitude that's non-judgmental, curious and kind. Sounds easy, doesn't it? And also sound and energy healing as well, which I'm really excited to hear more about today as well. So a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us here on the show today. Let me first of all tell you a little bit about our special contributors and our panel today, and that is Rajan Shah from Art Culture. Now, Rajan is uh, quite a specialist in his own field because after spending the first 10 years of his life in Kenya, he completed his degree at Goldsmiths College, University of London, to continue his career in the art and creative field. A few years on, the seeds of art culture were embedded, and now he uses art as a tool for mindfulness, where the strokes and concepts of creativity support mental well-being. We also have with us today Angelique Perez, who's the founder of D-Style Dance, What's that all about? Well, Angelique is a multi-award winning dance and fitness instructor. Now, dance is her passion. She teaches Bollywood dance to kids and adults and also Bollywood fitness and Zumba as well. And after surviving breast cancer last year, she's even more motivated to help others keep fit in body and mind. And we have Jay Ragani with us today as well, who is a mindset and sound practitioner as well from Optimum Wellbeing. Now, Jay Ragani is a mindset and sound practitioner, as well as a business mentor in emotional intelligence. Now, through holistic approaches that she has, she embraces the art and science of NLP coaching, hypnotherapy, mindfulness, and vibrational sound therapy to work with the whole person, the body, mind, and emotion too, and also promoting optimal well-being, reducing stress, anxiety, and having a positive and healthy outlook to all aspects of one's life. She also runs workshops on various aspects of mindfulness, the mind-body connection, and eight pillars of optimum well-being, as well as regular online sound baths as well. We're going to be learning all about these things from our three professionals that we have with us on the panel today. And once again, if you have just joined us, welcome to the Great Big Indian Wellness Show. So let me welcome them, first of all, Rajan Shah from Art Culture, Angelique Perez, founder of D-Style Dance, and Jay Ragani, mindset and sound practitioner from Optimum Wellbeing. Welcome all three of you. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Tony. Hi. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you. It's absolutely lovely to, to have you along there. There is so much to talk about, and I know there's going to be so little time in which to do so. So I'm going to press straight on and, first of all, come in straight away and throw this at all three of you. Most people know about mindfulness, right? But what are the challenges of sustaining the mindfulness habits daily? Like I said earlier in my introduction, it's easier said than done. It's almost a discipline, if you like. Uh, but sometimes trying to get the, the balance right is not that easy to do. So uh, perhaps uh, I, I could ask uh, you first of all, Rajan, to, to kick off on that one. Yeah, I think uh, generally for anyone to kind of get into a new kind of habit, it's uh, consistency. And I think mindfulness is another kind of, a, I wouldn't call it a hobby, but it's a, it's a daily practice. So if you want to do something, you're going to have to do it for at least 21 days to make it into a habit. And if you do it for 90 days, apparently that's what the professionals say. If you do it for 90 days, it actually becomes a lifestyle. So if you are going to embark on a journey of some sort of mindfulness, then consistency is the key. I think that's uh, where, where, what I've seen. What a great start. Angelique. Yes, so definitely so key. I mean, we are all so in the past have been so um, worried about our physical health, but mental health is just key. And mindfulness is such a great way to you know, achieve mental health and keep away the stress, anxiety and all of that. And people don't seem to realize that that's the key. I think 
what's been one of the challenges as you asked was the fact that we are so busy we're just rushing from thing to thing even as a mother um, and as a woman I would say that my mind is always thinking of multiple things at the same time so you know what am I making for dinner and what's happening tomorrow what's my next meeting even if you're doing one yeah, uh, yeah so mindfulness is so key to just stop that constant chatter in your mind Jay yeah, I think I would, um, you know, echo all of those. Um, it is very much the the biggest challenge I've always found is distraction. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to say, oh, this is more important or this is more interesting. So we have that whole area. But once you get into that focus point and say, I am more aware it could be awareness in whatever we do. It's not just art, it's not just dance, it's even awareness in everything around us. And the more you do that habit of becoming more and more aware, the more you actually enjoy it and you start to notice changes around you and within you. But like we all said, you know, it is practice. It is getting into that zone. And when you do get into that zone, it's, it's amazing. So I encourage well, everyone to have a go. <laughs> well, talking of which, I'm just going to pick up on that because Rajan mentioned uh, a moment ago that it's all about consistency. And he mentioned a, a scenario of 21 days and then moving them up to 90 days and becomes a habit and then a lifestyle. But it's really easier said than done, isn't it? Uh, Jay, uh, give, give me your, your take on this. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to, um, from my understanding and with the way I practice, it goes back to the way the brain starts to rewire. So when you've got an old habit, it's really ingrained into the neural pathways that this is mm. the way I perform something. So when you want to change a habit, you want to implement something new, we have to keep rewiring and rewiring that new pathway. And that is the key. So 21 days is kind of the minimum. I would say to rewire a new habit, a new way of life, a new form pattern. And the more you do it, the more the brain will automatically trigger into that pattern without us having to consciously be aware of it. That's the way it kind of works. It almost becomes at a very subconscious level that we start doing things automatically. Angelique, I'm probably the, one of the most inconsistent, inconsiderate, undisciplined, lazy uh procrastinating people you could ever come across but so programming my mind into doing something for 21 days leading up to 90 days is is easier than they're done angelique exactly and actually on that point tony i run a healthy living coaching program for 60 and 90 days mm -hmm. um and where we inculcate habits with people every single day so it, it sounds funny but we have like points for them to uh, note down what they did that particular day so in terms of physical health as well as mental health so we help them every single day with one-to-one -one coaching um, and that's how, you know, you can build a habit or if you are really committed, then you know what to do. You can put like an alarm on your phone to remind you every day to do something. So it's about taking those extra steps um, to make sure it becomes a discipline, habit. Discipline, really. discipline, discipline. Um, Rajan yeah. Shah from Art Culture, um, you actually use art as a tool for mindfulness where you look at the concepts of creativity to support mental well-being. So take into consideration what you shared with us initially and what Jay and Angelique have just said. How can you support mental well-being through the concepts of creativity? So generally art in itself um, is actually complete mindfulness because um, art uh, is non-judgmental. It's all about interpretation. So whenever somebody does something, um, there is very few times when somebody say, oh, I don't like this, but that's their interpretation. So as soon as you start doing some sort of creative activity, um, you are actually embarking on that uh, mindfulness journey. So even if it's a simple thing as writing some notes down, so a lot of people have taken up journaling, uh, for example, over the lockdown period. It's one way of expressing your thoughts into somewhere where maybe somebody is not listening, nobody's listening, nobody's reading, but it's for yourself. So art and mindfulness go hand in hand. So anything that you even doodle, for example, that is your journey through mindfulness. And uh, when you express something, when you're actually trying to create a, a piece of work or actually doing a stroke of paint, 
using the cho choice of colors that you have, whichever uh, color that you're choosing, you're actually expressing something in your head and you're actually trying to release that energy. And that release of energy is that what mindfulness is. So you're actually trying to kind of get away from that distraction and bringing some sort of a focus. And that's what mindfulness is. So anything to do with creativity, whether it's doodling or even writing notes or uh, some patchwork or uh, crochet, that's all uh, connected to uh, mindfulness for sure. So that's that's the whole intention of cultivating awareness around you and within yourself and understanding what needs to be done. And we've just uh, had a really good uh, discussion on uh, on the challenges of sustaining mindfulness and uh, making it a, a daily habit. If you have just joined us today on the Great Beginning Wellness Show, we are talking about the art of mindfulness today. And we are talking to Rajan Shah from Art Culture, Angelique Perez, who is the founder of D-Style Dance, and Jane Regani, who is a mindset and sound practitioner from Optimum Wellbeing as well. So here on the Great Big Indian Wellness Show today, as we talk about the art of mindfulness, I'd like to just divert from what we've just been talking about a few moments ago. Let's bring children into the equation here today and teenagers, because are they really able to express their feelings and emotions without being judged? We live in such a society, a fast moving society, and as Angelique was saying earlier on, uh, we're constantly... Uh, multitasking and sometimes we forget the little important bits the detail in life um, perhaps I could ask one of you to start us off on that particular side of the discussion where children and te teenagers are concerned Jay yeah um, I do quite a bit of work with children and it's more about them becoming more aware so where I come in is very much with sound working with sound, working with expression, and working with movement. And the more they become into the flow with sound, the more they are able to open up. And the opening up becomes more of a creative opening. So, so this is sound therapy we're talking about here? Yes. Yes, okay. it is. It's sound therapy. So that, you know, and often they may use drums like shamanic drums and, and you know, like chimes or a bowl, but it's an opening. It's an energy opening. And that kind of in, in a way brings them out. And then when I actually play instruments, I allow them to flow in whichever way they feel is right. And often people will feel, and children not so much, because children are in that place where they just want to play, they want to enjoy. Teenagers are a little bit more like, I'm not doing that kind of thing. But when you are in a place where you just close your eyes, you go with the sound, your body is naturally going to start to move. And those that are in the music world will understand that we move with sound. And that in itself is an expression. You take that a step further, it is actually energy that we're moving around in our body. Mm -hmm. And when we start to move that energy around, we are clearing energetic blocks in the body, which may hold us back from various, you know, creative sides, illnesses, um, aches and pains, you know, at a much deeper level, emotional level. So for me, I always see sound as a very important part of our everyday lives as part of movement and releasing. Angelique, what a perfect introduction to what you do as a dance teacher. Yes, exactly. So I work with children, teenagers and adults as well, any age group really, um, even seniors and you know many other groups inclusively. Um, and yes, I teach dance. So exactly what Jay said, music and movement is therapeutic. It really is because you're connecting to your soul really, you're also focused on that activity. You're not there being distracted. They're there learning the dance. They're kind of, you know, interacting. And so they're there in body and mind. And once you have the physical aspect, like Jay mentioned, you know, you've got the whole endorphins as well. Once you start moving and the activity, it's not only physically therapeutic, it's mentally therapeutic as well. You feel happier, you feel energized. I see all these amazing smiles from the kids, teenagers and my ladies as well. So it, it's super and it's just so therapeutic. I literally, you know, dance is uh, my medicine really. 
I, I must just tell you, I mean, I'm going to have a slight distraction here. Many, many years ago, uh, when I used to consume alcohol, I, I walked across the dance floor and uh, I won the dancing competition. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Exactly. How did you feel? <laughs> Quite embarrassed from what I can remember. But anyway, that's uh, another story for another day. Um, interestingly enough, yes, I, I think somebody's just caught on there. Uh, Rajan, um, with art culture and, uh, and as we talk about children and bringing the best out of them in terms of art of mindfulness, how can we bring, bring out feelings, expressions, emotions, from children, which are often suppressed through peer pressure, through their friends, through school. Um, Jay mentioned, even as a teenager, it can be sometimes difficult persuading them or showing them the right way because they're quite stuck in their ways. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So generally what I found uh, uh, recently is that the younger the generation, the younger the children, they're easier to kind of connect with. They, they, they appreciate art and they can actually connect with themselves. They can do the right strokes. But even then, you can actually realize when they're doing those kind of strokes, what strokes there are. So whether mm -hmm. they're actually expressing happiness, whether they're expressing anger, whether they're expressing fear. And through that, you can actually decipher what they're going through mentally. As they grow older, that connection loses a little bit through the strokes of a painting or some sort of a creativity. And then they go into some sort of a, a creative activity. So, for example, teenagers, you'll find very few that will actually paint some strokes of painting or sketching, very few. But then they need to be encouraged to actually get into some sort of journaling or some sort of note taking where they feel that they can talk to somebody. I think what, what, happen, what happens quite often is when they get to a particular teenage age, they feel that they can't talk to anybody and they use other mediums like social media as their partner. So whatever they see, yeah. that's what they connect with. So at that point, we need to try and find a way where they can actually change that energy to say, okay, rather than me using that energy, I want to put something into something else like a journaling or some sort of creative activity where they start connecting mentally. And I think that's the challenge that we have where as the uh, child goes to a slightly teenage age, we lose that. And I think that's where we need to try and uh, maybe focus on uh, a little that, bit. More. That's great, Roger, because what, what really intrigues me, and, uh, and I'm dying to ask you this question, is that when you see the work uh, of a child, a teenager, and you see their paintings or you see their journals, as you mentioned, and the way that they've expressed themselves, can you tell what's going through their minds when you look at their work? Yeah, uh, very, very often you can, because what happens is that sometimes they're actually... May, may leave certain things unfinished, which means that they want to say something to somebody, but there isn't anybody else to talk to. So for example, if they've used a particular color, for example, to uh, color the sky. So if they're using blues and greens, it's kind of a happy mood. It's again, color theory. If they're using browns and green, dark browns and dark greens, obviously it's a bit of a dull day or grays or whatever. So sometimes it's the interpretation of uh, the color, uh, color theory. What I found often is I, I do this exercise uh, in my art clubs is I actually get a parent to draw a scene from a childhood story. And they often actually pick up a certain story which they remember either them telling to their children or whatever. But sometimes you can actually see how small they draw, how large they draw. If they're small, they're still feeling insular. If they draw big, they become, you, you know that they, they're expressive. So similar goes with children. Sometimes when they're drawing small, they need to be encouraged to say, okay, it's okay to be experimental. It's okay to kind of express yourself. It's okay to draw bigger, use the space you've got, create your uh, surroundings. So it's interpretation. And I think it's over time when you start realizing when you work with a child saying, okay, this is how we've progressed and you can actually inter uh, interpret the way they're actually doing their creativity. That's so interesting, isn't it? And I'm sure that's a whole discussion in itself that we should have uh, in, in future broadcasts. Um, this is the Great Big Indian well, uh, Wellbeing Show. Uh, this is the Great Big Indian Wellness Show. And I'm Tony Patty. And with me here today is uh, Ranjan Shah from Art Culture. We have Angelique Perez, who's the founder of D Style Dance. And we also have Jay Ragani, mindset and sound practitioner from Optimum Wellbeing. Now, Jay, I'd like to just ask you, whilst we're on the subject of children, how does sound and energy heal and help children 
uh, or teenagers, uh, bearing in mind the discussion we've just been having with uh, Rajan and also Angelique as well? Yeah, um, in terms of sound, it's, it's really kind of very important to listen to the right type of music, the right tonality, the rhythm, all of that. Because if you imagine, if you listen to very heavy music, like heavy metal, rock, all of that, you generally are kind of like this. Um, and, you know, you may find that you get more agitated, you get more, your life feels very hectic, or you're just not relaxed. So the key is to listen to music that is very slow. The rhythm is at a better pace. And I'm sure Angelique knows very much about this. And so when we're working with children, we generally, or teenagers, we tend to use that more relaxation type of music or something that's got more gentle beats. And then there will be times when you want something a little bit faster because you want to shift what is going on in their body. Then that becomes the release that they have. So when we're working in groups, for example, I will use more relaxed type of music and then the drums will come in and we'll go beep, 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 really fast. And that raises that adrenaline and out they express. In terms of sound, it is a vibration, it is a frequency. So the vibration and the frequency is very key to energy. And, and the energy that has different levels. So what we wanna do is when we're working with energy healing in cooperation with sound, we need to get the right frequency. The body is made up with various different frequencies. So that's when we use different types of music to release that energy which is blocked in the body. So for example, children that have ADHD, uh, that struggle with those kind of emotional problems, we will use predominantly kind of like drums or like, um, yeah, predominantly drums and gongs because they can be played gently and also can be played fast. And they generally love it, which is, you'd think, well, why is that? Even elderly people with dementia and Alzheimer's, we would predominantly use those kind of instruments. Whereas if it's children, like smaller children, we would go more for the Mona Lina, the chimes, very gentle music, because you want to keep their body in balance all the time. Because the younger you are, the more balanced your energy is generally. It's only as we get older, we start to, the energy starts to get depleted or gets disturbed. So that's when older people generally need a little bit more work to rebalance. Thank you to all three of you for your very kind time, your great advice, and uh, the excellent things that you've shared with us here today on the Great Beginning Wellness Show. Thank you. <music>